Господа, одну минуту внимания, так как ведется видеозапись, просьба вопросы задавать микрофон. Maybe they can turn this off. Uh, 
My job was to check the facts. So some reporter would write a story, and it would say something like, uh, oh, Andrew Mason, TK years old. TK stands for to come. In other words, check this fact. Was born in TK City. And all the, all the facts in the story, it would be my job to assemble them. And sometimes I would discover that the, the points of view that the reporter expressed or the, the conclusions he came to were completely not supported by the facts, so he'd have to rewrite the story. Sometimes the facts supported what he said. But having to check the facts and put them in the story and then have to stand by them, it's what you do in business. It's what you do in your personal life. It's, it, it turns out to be some of the best training for almost anything in modern existence. And that training I took with me to everything else I've ever done. Let me, let me leave it at that. I will give long answers to questions. But with luck, somebody now has a question to start with. If not, I'll, I'll think of some. I've got somewhere. Maybe you have some. <coughs> Any qu and say who you are. There's a microphone. Yeah, you've got one. You can you can ask in very slow Russian also if you'd like. <laughs> take take the mic. Hi, so my name is Jim Um I have a question. I have a pitch. So the question is, um, it's not exactly what you're talking about. So it's a little bit like I, I'm asking very psychologists so you probably call it right. So the question is, uh, the web started this degree. Right, so the first large websites were successful, and they were many of the Korean sites, like Yahoo Directory and the Open Web Directory. Then came Google, killed them all. Uh, no, they, they killed them themselves. Well, they killed well, themselves. they killed themselves. I agree, I agree. But that killed the manually created web as, as, a, as, a, as a technology. <coughs> but now we see that trend is coming back, and the manually created web is appearing in the CSC. Because the content can be uh, broken down into location, or into social, on social graph, or uh, by time, and we see that appearing in like, Facebook likes and yeah. post prayer chickens and stuff like that. Uh, what do you think? Is it going, the history is going to repeat itself? Somebody is going to come up with some algorithm that will basically supplant all this manual operation, or not? Or is it okay. going to continue? That's the question. And, and, I, I have a pitch. and I have a pitch. And the pitch is simple. Uh, Google has a thing called uh, Tech Talks, when some people are invited to discuss something interesting that they know. So I would like, uh, like to invite you for a Tech Talk in Google. Ah, so you're from Google? Yes, I'm the head of Moscow Engineering. Okay. Uh, Sokolov. Yes. Great. And, okay. uh, you know Sergey Bukov, right? I do. And uh, you probably invested in this company. I did. And Google bought it, and it's, it was actually what uh, became Google Moscow. So yeah. you might be interested in coming and seeing well, what happened to, to that. There's one more piece to that story. So I, I was indeed an investor in Dulance, and I came to visit you after, after Google had acquired it. And I'm on the board of Yandex. Uh, but okay. So no, it's okay. So, <laughs> so I had, I walked in and I said, you know, this is very nice. It's nice to see you, but I can no longer ask you about business because I'm on the board of Yandex. So let's talk about politics. And they were very unhappy. They didn't want to talk about politics at all. I was very disappointed. But right now we're different. I mean, the, yeah. the problem is you're, different. You're the office is different, yeah. and we're much bigger. Right, and you're no longer in. Um, yeah. Well, we're in Belgium. Belgium. Yeah, right. We have the full floor now. In the Baltic? In the Baltic uh, business center. Interesting. That's okay. very nice. Yeah, I will, I will come. Okay. So let me think about your question. Uh, I disagree with your premise. The, the curated web did not disappear. It did not stop working. Yahoo's portal lost... Yeah, it's a long business story how they pretty much committed suicide. And certainly Google took over all the sex appeal, they took the visibility and, and all the excitement. But what often happens in the market is people's attention shifts. But 
the business model that worked continues to work in many cases, not in the case of the music industry, but in the case of curated content in vertical markets in specific fields, it, it kept working. And, and there's lots of small focus sites that continue. What's changed is the scale of the web. Initially, you could, in fact, curate the entire web. Now it's, it's not really possible to do that in any sensible way. You can, you can curate particular fields. Uh, what's really changed is people no longer want to find information. There, there's really two or three things going on. The first is they want to do stuff. And at some dinner three or four years ago, Bill Gates said the following, which nobody picked up on, but I thought it was tremendously clever. He said, the future of search is verbs, not nouns, not things, but verbs, transactions. I want to book a table, I want to uh, reserve a flight, I want to change something, I want to buy something, I want a transaction, I want to change the state of the world, I don't simply want some information in my face. And most especially, I don't want a web page. I want some meaningful information, perhaps what Duance and now Google shopping or whatever they call it, approval. What that does for you is it puts products and prices in context. Where can I get this product? What are the other prices? And maybe can I buy this product? Uh, they have flight search, which is no longer search. It's really booking flights. Uh, Google Maps is a great example. Yeah, imagine the original Google, you put in an address, and it ranks all the things that are close to that address in a list, according to their, you know, you really don't want that, you want a map, you want a visualization of where this thing is. And so, if a search engine is shining a light onto what you want, what you really want is a lighted room, and all the shelves are raised, and, and to do that, one way is human curation, uh, especially in terms of not the topic covered, but the, the quality of the coverage. Yeah, is this an insightful article or is it a stupid article about the same topic? The insightful article should rank higher. In theory, it used to be that webmasters' links were a pretty good measure. Now, of course, there's a lot of discussion about how that no longer works, and I don't know how closely you all follow Google's activities, but now they're fighting spam with new, more human-centered algorithms and so forth. Uh, looking at someone's social graph and saying, saying implicitly the content that his friends like is the content he will like, or let's look at this expert and the people around this expert. So there, there are algorithmic ways to curate large amounts of content. But to me, the more interesting thing is, in fact, putting structure into the content and figuring out not simply how close things are, but their relationship. Is this an argument for or against a particular proposition? Is this guy subservient to or the boss of this other guy? Uh, how do these things stand in relation? Build an infrastructure, build an ontology. So recently, you, Google, acquired a company called MetaWeb, which does that. Uh, on the other hand, Microsoft acquired MedStory and PowerSet, which are not part of Bing. So two directions, human curation, but also far more structure, and finally, more transactions. And I, I think it's fascinating. Uh, but I would say the word curation has changed its meaning from something humans do to something that you try to automate. If you want to argue, that will make it more interesting, especially for... Maybe somebody else wants to, because I don't want to hijack you. Okay. I'll, I'll, come and talk. I'll come and talk to your guys. That would be fun. Okay. Thanks. Is this... Someone else? Oh, are there any other questions? Oh. There, there better be, it's going to be oh, very short. If, if, if this were a Soviet Union, we would certainly like place prepared questions yes. and you will have a list well, of answers in advance. So.
Uh, no, no problem, a great user generated le lecture. Last year we were in Nova Scotia. Uh, it's was, still in the Soviet Union? Uh, <laughs> they had a meeting the day before our meeting, instructing the students what questions to ask. And, uh, yeah, still. Yeah, yeah, so the first question was for the president of eBay, Mr. Donahoe. I can see you are living the American dream. Will you tell me more about the American dream? If, I wonder why they sent it to Moscow to be approved and then they... I think that, <laughs> oh gosh, I don't think that took place. Let me forward to your ideas on this episode. Maybe they just were trying to prepare for the being nice. You know when it's, it's weird when mm, everyone's quiet. It was, it was somewhere between your version and your version. Probably. The students were instructed what to ask us. Uh, more or less. They didn't... You're right, they wanted there to be content, and they didn't want it to be bad content. And of course, we hijacked the meeting and started asking the students questions. And it got much more interesting. Anyway, someone had a question. Uh, my question... My name is Kalam, uh, and, uh, my question is... Uh, where are you from? What's your... Uh, are you a student? Yes, or? I'm a student. And uh, I work in a uh, resource business. Like uh, and my question uh, is uh, about uh, your opinion. Uh, what is uh, the best way to do a startup business? For example, if uh, uh, a man uh, has a good idea, and uh, what is a better way? Uh, try to do uh, something uh, by himself, and uh, or maybe by himself with uh, some little group of pressures and uh, uh, when uh, try uh, to find uh, uh, specialists or investors. Or oh, it is better to find uh, investors and uh, good specialists in uh, the beginning uh, of uh, doing business, in the very beginning. So the point is what is uh, better? Try to do uh, maybe the better version uh, by uh, yourself or uh, find uh, uh, specialists and investors uh, in only our idea. Yeah. So, what's the best way to prepare a dinner? <coughs> do you go to the store and buy a prepared dinner? Or do you get the ingredients and go home and cook? Or do you ask your girlfriend? <laughs> right. That's, that's your answer. It depends on the situation. But let me, let me try to be useful. First, if you have, I mean, clearly, if you have no money, you need somehow, you need a job, you need to keep making money. If your idea is a really great one, maybe you can get an investor. But most companies, the idea is not so great. And what really matters is the implementation. So when you come to the investor, He's not going to invest in your idea. He's going to invest in your team, if you have one. He's going to invest in a software product you've already built, and you have thousands of users, but not hundreds of thousands. And he thinks, with a little bit of money, you could hire a marketing person, and then you could actually build a company. So investors don't invest in ideas. They invest in companies. And if you have already created one successful company, then they may invest in you, plus your idea, in the belief that you can create a company. But if, if all you have is an idea, you're unlikely to find an investor. And so your best, your best approach is not to go find somebody famous and ask them for money, but to find a friend who believes in you. And together to build enough whether it's, it's a website or a service or a product, and to, to keep building it piece by piece until you have something that proves your capabilities and that proves that the product can attract customers, and then you will get investors. Okay, and in case uh, it is uh, very complicated stuff and uh, you can't uh, do it by yourself or by yourself with uh, one or two friend, other people, yeah. uh, what should you do in this case? Well, then usually what I would say is go, 
you know, and I don't know you or your business, but I would usually say go get a job in the field that you're interested in and do three things. One, learn a lot. Learn about the customers, learn about the problems they have, learn about the context in which they operate. Two, learn how to be a manager. Uh, the best way to learn how to be a manager is to have a good manager managing you, which, of course, you can't always get. But try, try to see what's being done right in this company and what's being done wrong. What is it that motivates people? How do they work together effectively? Or how do they work badly together? And the third thing you'll learn is potential customers. Because you'll be in the marketplace. You'll know the people who have the problems that your product will solve. And then, if you, if you do it right, one of these customers or one of these people that you meet through this job will know you and trust you enough that maybe they'll lend you some money or give you some space in which to start your business, something like that. But if you have nothing to start with, getting a job in the area in which you're interested is actually a very good way to develop what you really need for a business, which is not simply the idea, but the contacts and the industry knowledge and the connections and the people and the people skills. And that, that can take two or three years. It's, it's not easy. But it, it actually is the best way to do it rather than try to start immediately with no resources. You bet. And ask all your school friends to help you. Hi. Uh, my name is Ron. My name is Roma, and uh, I know that you are interested in space, uh, space uh, tourism. Yeah? And uh, what's your, uh, who, what's the most uh, interesting? Um, uh, what did you find uh, the most uh, impressive? And uh, also, uh, uh, what do you think about the cost of space flight? In 20 years, in today's dollars. Thank you. Yeah, it, that was my question as well. Why, why Star City? Why spend half a year? Have you seen everything on Earth and need to see something in the outer space? Yes, actually. Um, <laughs> so, I'm standing here. I'm, I'm one of the luckiest people in the world. When I finished my college education, then I went and I learned fact-checking at Forbes magazine. I learned the finance investment business on Wall Street. And then I learned all about the computer business and the software business. And so at Harvard, I did not go to class. But once I left college, I started my education. And, and it continues. And, one, one thing I wanted to learn about was space. And if you want to learn about France, you can go to a class in French literature and another class in French history, or you can go and live in France. And I did the equivalent. I didn't get to live in space, but I did live in Star City for six months. The, there were two things that motivated me. One was, indeed, I got interested in space, and I'll explain that. The second is... Just a clarifying question. So yeah. between living in France and having a book on French history, you choose a book of French history? No. Oh. I choose living in France. Oh, sorry. Sorry, yeah. I, I, That's not my choice. No. Okay. And I think... So to me, you always learn more by being in the place. And you can ask the French people about French history. And they'll, they'll give you some version that may or may not be correct. Uh, the most interesting thing usually is what they don't tell you because they consider it so obvious it doesn't need any discussion. Uh, the basic assumptions, the basic assumption in the United States is that the people created the government. The basic assumption in Europe is that the king owns the people. And nobody even talks about it. It's just so clear and it, it affects a great deal of how people think about everything. So I decided to go live in Star City, both 
to learn about space and also to learn about the Bushi Sovietsky Soyuz. Uh, I've been coming to Russia since 1989, and I've always been just a visitor. I wanted to see what it's like to, to really live inside a closed city. It's, of course it's changed, but Star City was the closest thing I could get as a civilian foreigner. I still have my Propusk, and I lived in an Obshizhet here. I uh, went to the Stolovia actually two times a day for dinner. I got invited to have dinner with the, the NASA astronauts who also lived there. Uh, I learned so much more simply by living the life rather than by studying it in a book. Precisely because people took things for granted and didn't tell me. You just That's what you learn, what people don't question. Uh, I also learned a great deal about space travel and... Uh, I, I don't know the Russian word for this. I don't know if you know the English, the Russian word plumbing. Canalizatia. Canalizatia, yeah. Uh, most of what you learn about the International Space Station is how to keep the water system working, how to clean the toilets, how to keep the air system flowing, how to cook things. Uh, what to do in case of emergency, and how to fix all these machines. So up on the space station, they spend a little time doing science. They spend some time doing PR and communicating with the Earth, and then they spend the rest of the time basically making sure that this home keeps working and fixing all the machinery. Understanding that, and then understanding also space medicine. It was... For me, it was completely worth it. Uh, for many people, it probably would not have been. So I spent six months and three million dollars, and yeah, had the the education of a lifetime in a in a particular subject. So space uh, in the United States, it has been just as in Russia just like the internet originally, a government project, uh, a holy calling, uh, a priesthood, and there was kind of a, like a clerical class that took care of this facility, whether it was the internet or space. And the notion that it should be invaded by commercial interests was considered heresy back in 1991 or 1992, some salespeople from, I think, Sun Microsystems or Digital Equipment used the internet to send out an email inviting people to a sales seminar. And they were criticized with, with horror for using the internet for such a low, disgusting commercial enterprise. And they're, so I joined it. There was this thing created called the uh, Commercial Internet Exchange or something that was to foster freedom of the internet to use it for commercial things. And of course, everybody knows history. The internet became commercial. It grew much faster. It became a tremendous facility, not just for science and research and education, but also for finance and for commerce. Uh, also for consumer self-expression, for the narcissism you talked about, and, and also now for freedom in, maybe not freedom in Libya, but freedom in Egypt, and freedom in Russia. Uh, whatever, it's, it's, it's a miracle that's happened. And the same thing is now happening to space. Interestingly, in Russia, the government is willing to sell space on the Soyuz, not just to American government employees, but also to American frivolous space tourists. Or, or to me, I was a space tourist backup. Uh, in the United States, the U.S. government would never do that. The only way to get onto a U.S. government spacecraft is you know, by some special contest for teachers or other special people, or, or by being a government employee and being an astronaut for 12 years or something. Uh, now there's a private commercial space business, a company called SpaceX, 
Which some of you may, how many of you have heard of SpaceX? Okay, the guy who asked the question, and one other person. Uh, there's a commercial company that sent a rocket, not just into space, but into orbit. And now the U.S. government, which is closing a shuttle program and is relying on the Soyuz for bringing its astronauts into the space station, is also going to be relying on private commercial companies. So the cost of space travel is going to go down dramatically. But it's not going to go down like the cost of computers, unfortunately, because the, the physics of getting things up into space is, is still... Yeah, it's, it's atoms, it's not bits. Uh, but at the same time, the whole space program will be driven not just by space tourists, but also, I believe, by space mining, space energy, uh, such things. And so I'm also on the NASA Advisory Council giving NASA, the U.S. government, space organization advice. Not that they listen. And trying to get them to understand the importance of synthetic biology. If you want to change the climate on Mars, it's not going to be through machinery, but actually through some new kind of plants that are grown, not, not constructed. And ultimately, I think that's going to be the answer to U.S. pollution problems as well. It's, it's not machinery, it's not carbon scrubbing, but it's actually growing some kind of plants that will help to deal with some of our energy problems. So, that, I hope that was your answer. And if you want to go into space or something, you can write to me afterwards. <laughs> Well, when we started this conversation, if we mentioned 13, I actually want to ask you, you said you came here in 1989. That means you saw Russia for more than 20 years change. Yes. What do you think the basic assumptions that stayed from the Soviet Union times, they're still there, and for example, you can give your opinion on that. And what do you like right now about Russia? Okay. Changed Russia, most of them. So first, let me ask, who was born before 1989? Okay. Anyone born after 1989? Yeah, okay. Amazing. Uh, so, the first question is what has changed, more or less? Or what, no, what actually has stayed the same? Yes, yeah. basic assumptions. Well, so th there's one... How many of you are students here? and from outside. Okay. So this is the economic school. I remember in 1991, I guess, I was talking to some Russian who was quite well educated and watched CNN, and he said with great excitement, this is wonderful. Our government is going to set free market prices just like yours. The government is going to set the free market prices. Uh, you know, he knew he wanted free market prices, but he had no idea what that really meant. Because his whole concept of how prices... How could prices be set other than by an official determining the price of something? It, it, so I would say most people now understand the concept of free market prices. But probably the, the, worst, the worst unspoken thinking that pervades everything is that fundamentally making a profit is evil. That it means stealing from somebody else. That, you know, there's... It's kind of like I, I used... You know, we know profits are good because they make the economy work, but fundamentally they're, they're not really nice. They're not. Somebody who's trying to make a profit is just probably a bad person. And when I see a lady in a mink coat or a, a fur coat, I think, ah, she's probably the mistress or the wife, depending on her age, of some oligarch. I rarely think, oh, she must be a very effective businesswoman who earned the money to buy the coat herself. That's in my head. Uh, it's very difficult to change these social attitudes about how things work. And 
right now, I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, and they think the life, when I ask the guys at Dulance to talk about politics, they think people who mess in politics, they're either careerists who want power, or they're stupid, foolish idealists who are going to go and you know, support Khodorkovsky or do something like that. But it's, it's foolish to try and change the system and just live within the system and, and do what you can. Uh, the, I stay with a family who are very nice people. I call them mini-garks. The wife is a very nice lady. And so I suggested to her, I, I ran into this charity that gives money to take care of orphans and so forth. Wouldn't she like to, to work with these people? And she said, no, all these orphanage, you know, all these charitable things, they're just scams. Uh, people really, making profits is evil, but at the same time, everybody has bad motivations, except perhaps vis-a-vis -vis your own family members. The, the biggest problem in Russia that still exists is a lack of trust uh, of almost everybody except the people you know personally. And that makes it very difficult to build large businesses that aren't top-down you know, old structures. It makes it very difficult to run a charity. It makes it very difficult to even keep the stairwell of the building clean. Because no one even wants to cooperate with their neighbors. It's my own apartment, and the public space, I don't care about. And that's really the thing that's the saddest still about Russia, this lack of trust and suspicion of other people's motivations. And you're smiling, so I hope you have an answer. Me? Yeah. Well, I think that it's true what you said. Mm -hmm. It's a really good answer that it's lack, I think, of lack of trust goes from the lack to believe in something. Because people were taught to believe in something that just in one day disappeared, that was ruined to little pieces, and then they were suggested something not theirs. Yes, yeah, some new ideas that came from outside. And you know, people, they felt themselves probably deceived. Well, like, you know, they were forced deceived. To deceive. Yeah, that's the word. And that's why it goes, probably because they were taking away some trust and beliefs and they were given something. Maybe the new generation that grew up without the Soviet Union past will have different point of view, that's my opinion, because they have a little different heritage. But again, I think it's the future only to show the truth, to answer to this question. But I really like this. Like, I think what you said is really true. And what about the new things you like about Russia? What really thing you think is now better than it used to be? And what do you believe Russia can expect in the future okay. going this way? We are right, right yeah. now. Well, of course I could say that all of you in this room are the hope of the future and all this, but I don't know you. So, the thing, in many ways it is the internet and the freedom that has changed things. Every time you use Yandex to find something out, every time you go to uh, tutu.guru to find out when the electricity runs, uh, every time you go and find a price for a product, or even you read about your government, you read about our government, you read about what's happening in Libya, the, the change in mentality from some things are better not discussed and some things are better not asked about to I can find out about anything. I might ignore it. I don't want to pay attention. I don't believe it. But I have the right to ask questions and I expect to find the answers. You, know, you tell me, do you think that's, is that your attitude that you can ask questions about anything? Yes? No? Yes? Uh, so, lots of people aren't raising their hands. Who thinks you can't ask questions? You, you're afraid to answer, right? Uh, but I, 
I don't know, somebody, do you, do you think that's wrong, that it, it's still a land of silence? I get silence in response. <laughs> Well, it's not the land of silence if no one answers. I feel like I can answer something. It's just, uh, again, it goes uh, from the past, from the heritage, and asking questions. I think people are scared inside, like when you're growing in school, and, you know, it, it comes from the families as well, what people are taught to do. For example, mm, no one really likes... I think in Russia that there is such a problem, but I also want people to discuss it because otherwise it doesn't make sense, you know, my, my interviewing or my saying that um, when you say the truth, no one really wants to know the truth because we all live by socially expected behaviors, you know, and it's especially typical for people who grew up in stress, like being, you know, ruled to do certain things. So this is all generation in Russia. We do, uh, probably everyone can say, agree that it was the totalitarian regime. So it was, people have to do something. So that's why they are probably afraid to ask questions and to behave like that, to be open. And sometimes people think that it's better not, not, not to know the truth and just leave their ways. And that, that is a part of mentality. I, I think that exists. For example, I like to ask questions, and it doesn't add me popularity on the opposite. And people say that, why she is rude? Why she is saying that? I don't want to know that. Why she stresses these ideas? So this, in my opinion, this is part of the problem that people grew up in the situation when, they, when it was better not to say something and just mind your business. It's also quite actually a difference between, I think, different parts of Russia. Uh, there is, in Moscow, there are certain types of behaviors, like people should, you know, be more, more, more quiet, calm, and, you know, bring the truth right away. It's more actually goes to Siberia. Maybe they were asking students to prepare the questions they didn't want them, you know, to blow something. Or oh, there's someone who wants to get into this question. Okay, great. Oh. <laughs> you, you're not afraid of being sent to Siberia. <laughs> Actually, I wanted to ask a very practical question. Internet is changing our life. You know, such a huge amount of information every day we have to, to, to read, to hear, and now we all have our Facebook pages, Twitter, we, have, we are reading blogs, and so on, and maybe internet has changed uh, the, the social patterns. C can you explain, describe these changes, the systematic ch system changes of people's uh, way of living? I don't know how to explain. Okay, well, if you don't know how to ask, I don't know how to answer, but I'll try. No, I mean, um, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll explain some. I mean, the first thing to understand is, of course, between the United States and Russia, between the early adopters in the United States and the late adopters between people who are people are students who have a lot of time because they don't have to go to class and people who are working and have families and have no time because they have families and children. All these things are experienced in different ways and to some extent I think the, the people who look at the behavior sometimes are confusing being a student with being online and being on Twitter. And in fact, people's lives will also change in accordance with the stage of their life. And then the person with the family and the children and the job gets divorced, and then they go back to being more like a student and they, they get online more. So to answer your question, 
people used, long, long ago, people lived within a very small circle. And actually, they, they probably trusted the people in that circle. And then there were, you know, officials that they specifically didn't trust. But there wasn't, they didn't need to make very many decisions, and they didn't have very many choices. And in many ways, their lives were very simple. You know, there were three girls you could marry, three jobs you could have, uh, you had to stay in your own village. And so it was very, you know, maybe you could regret you married this girl instead of the other girl. But beyond that, there was, there was very little freedom and there was very little responsibility. Uh, and so people weren't necessarily happy, but they also didn't regret. They didn't say, oh, I was stupid, I should have done this. Because they had no choice anyway. So your, your job in living was simply to do the best with what you were given. But then the world changed entirely. It changed for people in general because they could leave their city, they had many more choices, they went to university. It changed for women. Suddenly the choice wasn't simply who should you marry, but you might have your own career, you might make your own decisions about a lot of things. It changed for people in Russia because suddenly the bureaucrats no longer told them which job to have. They had to make up their own minds about their careers. And so many, many, many more possibilities for regret. Now, even your friends, you know, let's say you have 20 friends. Now there's hundreds of friends out on Facebook or for Contactia that could be your friends. And so people get overwhelmed with choice, and it doesn't actually make them happier. It, it may make them confused. It gives them more ability to regret. It gives them often less loyalty to their existing friends because they're always looking for new friends or thinking maybe this thing is better or that thing is better. And I think right now, and again, it, it happens for different people in different societies and different groups that are different ways. People are overwhelmed with too much and they need to understand for themselves how to, how to deal with too much choice, not not to put on the blinders, but to to appreciate what they already have. Not not out of a sense of I can't get any more. But you know, if friend is not just this is the best friend you could have. A friend is I invest in the friendship, and together we've created a friendship that creates something of value. It's it's not the intrinsic value of the person, but the value of the friendship, the shared experience, whatever. Coming coming back from sort of the, if you like, the glitter, the, the false lights of the web, to understanding what real friendship means, to valuing what you've created rather than what you might possibly get, is, is the psychological challenge that people face because of all this stuff. Now, I don't know whether you were asking a more practical, technical question or this one I just answered, but... I think it's a design challenge. It's almost a design challenge uh, to the challenge Soviet, former Soviet people face when Soviet, Soviet stopped existing. Yeah, it is, in many ways. This complete freedom is very confusing. The trend, yeah. The children, the people that are now small, which they will, which, which world they will be living in. I don't know. I think, to some extent, I think it's the job of their parents to help them understand the, both the opportunities and the limits. Um, I have, I have some very rich friends, and you know it's actually very convenient. If you want to go on vacation, you have constraints. The amount of money you have, the amount of time. If you're very rich, you have no constraints, and so it's it's, it's actually difficult to make choices because you could choose anything. And how you help a person build. You know, maybe not constraints, but some set of values inside themselves. When the world outside gives them all the possibilities, it's it's the challenge you're going to face as parents for your children. Who they can live anywhere in the world, they can have any job, 
and therefore they need to decide what they really want rather than become overwhelmed with this choice. Maybe some uh, business questions or sensible questions, whatever. Oh, no, no, please. Go ahead. Uh, my name is I'm a journalist. I have a situation with uh, a person uh, connection uh, that um, about um, the collection of personal information in Nevada and the uh, uh, intelligence um, of the fact that it's not impossible to stay anonymous or, uh, anymore and your idea of WikiLeaks also. <laughs> okay. Um, so, personal information on the internet, it is, th there's kind of three things to be said. There's the whole commercial thing of people follow my behavior so they can sell me stuff. And to me, that's a reasonable bargain. I'll trade that information for getting better offers, for, for convenience, whatever. But there are companies, there are a lot of companies who don't make it as a bargain. They sort of unilaterally follow you and don't tell you. I think that's a stupid business model. And it's it's a very common one. I, I can talk more about the United States, but they've been very sneaky about collecting the information and not telling you. Now, in the US, people don't understand how much information is out there and is available, and they're now discovering it, and they're getting some people are getting very upset, some people don't care, but it's, it's creating a lot of commotion and discussion and political action about do not track, and it was a stupid approach on the part of the business community. Uh, second answer is personal privacy. I think it's important to be able to choose. Personally, in some ways, I'm very transparent. In others, I'm quite private. And I think it's my right to make that decision. I don't think it's my right to get free content anonymously. Uh, but it is my right to be anonymous. Uh, and so I think many people don't think about this very clearly. So I'm, I'm hoping to create and, and working for an environment where people understand better the bargains they are making. Now, in practical terms, when you're talking not about somebody trying to find out whether I want, you know, which airline I prefer, but my really private secrets, it's possible for me to be anonymous by not going on the web, by paying with cash, uh, by using elaborate technical mechanisms for privacy. I'm an investor in a company called Anchor Free, which was started by a Russian emigre called David Gorodjansky that is now being used in the Middle East and China by people trying to be anonymous. It works pretty well. But if someone really wants to get after you, they can find you. And so anonymity is not total. Uh, if the government really, really tries, you know, they can have people watch you in physical life. They can go to your neighbors and have them spy on you. It's, so neither end of that spectrum from complete anonymity to complete exposure is, is true. It's, it's always going to be a battle and a negotiated tension for people who really, really care. Most people just find some place on the spectrum and, and it works. For WikiLeaks, uh, I wrote about this. I met, actually, I had an, I met Julian Assange a year and a half ago at a conference in Barcelona. And I'd heard about WikiLeaks. It, 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 you all know about WikiLeaks? Raise your hands. Yeah, okay. Great. How many have actually visited the WikiLeaks site? Okay. Um, so I'd heard about WikiLeaks. Julian was a really interesting guy. Uh, sort of creepy. And I, whatever, I, I just thought... This is a really interesting guy. We spent two hours talking outside, and then, yeah, suddenly a year later, the whole thing exploded. Um, he, so there's WikiLeaks and there's Julian Assange. I think WikiLeaks is a, a wonderful service. 
long ago there was something called anon.pennet.fi. Very old people here in this audience may remember that back in 1989, Russia wasn't really on the internet. You were connected to the internet. And you had something called UUCP, and there were basically two or three channels. One was through NIFAS and the government to the International Atomic Energy <coughs> Agency in Vienna. And then there was this guy up in Finland, Jolf Helsingius, who finally made a connection through to a guy called Leo Tomberg in Estonia and opened up the internet to the, the private people. And it's a long story, but Jolf Helsingius was a fantastic guy, and he had an anonymous server also, which was eventually shut down by the Christian scientists because it kept posting stuff that they didn't like. So Julian was not the first guy to do something like this. WikiLeaks, it, it was not only a place, it is not only a place where you can upload interesting information, it was a place that spent a lot of effort on authenticating the information. Because, you know, Kompromat, Falshivka, it's easy to send stuff to WikiLeaks that's not true, that's fake, that's... So WikiLeaks had a lot of people, and their, their job was to make sure that the information was vetted properly, and they weren't simply posting stuff that was just created to create trouble for somebody. And that's a very useful service. Ironically, WikiLeaks was quite centralized. Uh, you needed this central service that did that authentication task. It wasn't simply a server in the sky. It was a system of a service to try to make sure that the information was better. Uh, in that centralized system, Julian Assange seems to become a little dictator who wouldn't listen to his own people, who kind of lost his touch with reality, uh, who was not respectful of women. I'm saying this in a very coded way, but it's, it seems to be the case. And you know, if someone had been, if someone had actually shot Hitler, that person probably would have been a liar, he probably would have betrayed his friends, he would have stolen guns, he would have you know, lied to people, perhaps murdered a few people to get to Hitler before he killed Hitler. And that person would not have died for our sins, he would have sinned on our behalf. And I think that's probably the best way to describe Julian. He was, he is a far from perfect individual, but he actually has done good for the world. Now, then you ask about WikiLeaks itself. I think having the information come out by and large is great. That doesn't mean all the information is good. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be collateral damage of people who are named or discovered. Net net, I think its existence is probably good for the world. However, in many cases it's going to cause governments to have even more secrecy rather than less, which is really a pity. In the US, I'm on the board of the Sunlight Foundation, which is dedicated to transparency. Some of us are fighting very hard. We don't believe government secrets are always evil. We do believe that most government secrets should not be secret, and we think the government should do a much better job of distinguishing what's really secret, including perhaps negotiations with other countries, including people's personal information. Uh, keeping that stuff really secret, effectively, and then letting the other stuff be open. Because what the US government did was they had kind of a light, light secret veil around way too much stuff, and then it wasn't very secure. My basic feeling about transparency is, as an individual, I deserve privacy, and I should be as opaque as I want. The moment I start offering things to the public, the moment I start saying, give me something because I will pay you later, uh, the moment I'm an official who bestows favors, then I should give up a corresponding amount of transparency because I have, I'm making public promises, I'm handing out public goods, 
and I should lose the proportionate amount of privacy around the relevant issues. And defining that, of course, is, is a big challenge. But the, the principle, to me, is pretty clear. That anyone who controls government assets should lose their privacy. Uh, not about who their girlfriend is, unless their girlfriend is receiving some of those public assets. And so you, you, need, you need common sense to figure out what should be private and what shouldn't, but the principle's clear. And it's a long way from that happening anywhere. Thank you. And the second question is about the future of media. There. Uh, what is your idea? How will generated content or will influence professional journalism? Well, you, okay. User generated content creates a lot of competition for professional journalism. And, you know, I'm pretty cynical about everything, like the internet and space travel. But I actually think journalism is a holy calling. And that it really, that search for the truth is tremendously important. And, you know, user generated content, that's fine. You can have your own opinions. Uh, it would be nice if users would check their facts. And they certainly have a moral obligation to do so, but they know yeah, they're not in the business. And to go back to the privacy thing, you know, if you're just a user, you can have your own opinions, and you may well be wrong. If you're a journalist, you have an obligation to figure out the truth and to acknowledge your biases and so forth and so on. Keeping that holy calling pure and, and making it clear what's journalism and what's everything else is really, really important. Uh, again, not that it's actually happening all the time, but to me, the professional journalist and the whole enterprise of being independent and objective and a source of the truth is, is tremendously important. I don't think it should be funded by governments. I think in many cases it's very difficult for it to be funded by the users directly. And I think that kind of journalism may well be funded by philanthropists in the future. And I think that's an important area for philanthropy. Now the, the gentleman behind you. I'm Russell Pittman. I'm a visiting professor at New York Comic School. My day job, I'm a U.S. government economist. Ah. Um, They've been watching me. <laughs> well, worse, I work for the Antitrust Division of the Justice Department. Oh, great. That's a holy calling. Thank you. Well, I think economics is a holy calling. I think Sonia and I are looking for the truth when we can find it. Um, so my question is actually getting back to uh, getting back to the Internet. Um, we, um, in the U.S. at least, there's been a lot of discussion about net neutrality and uh, how, much, how much particular users should be able to purchase favorite access, help develop better net tools, and so forth. Any thoughts on, on uh, how, how much the government should prevent private entities that may control some of the backbone or something like that? Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, how many here know what this term net neutrality means? Okay. I don't either. Uh, there is a huge argument going on in the United States that Dr. Pittman, your doctor, is referring to. And net neutrality basically means, usually people think it's good, and then it means what they want. Some other people think it's bad, and then it means what they want. But it's it actually... It's one of these words that gets thought about so much it has no meaning. The, the fundamental question is basically around competition in, mostly right now, in the broadband marketplace, in, in Internet access. And should a company that controls an Internet, the Internet backbone system, should they be able to determine what content people see? And the problem that many people get into is, I like antitrust as opposed to regulation of net neutrality, because antitrust says if there's a competitive problem, 
if customers are not free to choose, if a company is using its market power, for example, if I'm using the fact that I'm not the only internet provider in town to favor some content over another, then antitrust law applies and this anti-competitive behavior can be stopped. The reality is the situation is very complicated. In some cities there are only two internet providers and they can, they can control the market uh, not just for content, but for internet pricing. In other cities, you have WiMAX, you have three or four broadband providers, you have lots of different providers competing, and then there's no problem. And in the United States, I think a single law is going to end up not being appropriate for this broad variety of situations. So, you know, the word neutrality sounds very good, and I'm for neutrality. I'm not necessarily for net neutrality as is defined by some of the market players who use it to favor their own position, including I see nothing wrong with people paying more for more access. I see nothing wrong with paying for content. I see nothing wrong with someone who has content paying more to provide that content with greater bandwidth to users, as long as there's a free competitive environment and other people can compete with that. So it's a complicated answer, but fundamentally my, my response is that I think antitrust is a much better means of dealing with this than trying to create a regulation in a marketplace that changes so quickly that the moment you create a law, it's going to be out of date and not apply to many, many situations. And it's kind of like some of my answers to other questions. You really need to figure out what is the principle, and then the actual application of the principle ends up depending a great deal on the particular situations. And you can certainly write papers about the different situations and the different trade-offs, but trying to write a law, I think antitrust and, and people's judgment is much more effective than a blanket policy. And so, to your question, the less the FCC regulates the internet other than requiring free competition and then letting antitrust deal with places where that doesn't work is probably more effective. My, my only possible rebuttal, I, 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 like what you, I like a lot of what you just said, my only possible objection would be that antitrust relies on generalized judges to enforce the law versus a, an expert regulator like the FCC. Yeah. The generalized judges can, can make a lot, a lot of, a lot more, a lot of more errors. Maybe. They can make mistakes, but if you have a regulator, this is probably not of general interest. Um, it's a good point, but I think in the end, I'd rather rely on antitrust and try to educate them than <coughs> the regulators just get co-opted too much. No, this is good. I'm keeping the course yeah. in antitrust here, so oh, okay. I, I appreciate Great. it. It's yeah. Fun. There, and then, and then, oh, I'm happy to stay late, but I, I know I don't want to keep you late. Oh, sure, yeah, no, I, mean, I'm, I said I'm happy to stay, I just don't want to. So my name is Ruben, I'm a professor here. I have two questions mostly related to the social behavior of people. So I mentioned that like, the first is uh, more practical to like the name behavior. I mentioned that a lot of Things that are now happening in the internet depends on the social behavior. People who do it for for other reasons than money. But often, like commercial firms, want to use this input to make money. Correct. And people would be appalled if they know this. Uh, and, uh, what are what are the strategies for commercial firms to how to persuade people to engage in this interaction and not by, and not that they make the people? Uh, well, I think. Most people do understand that firms may be making money off them, uh, but you know their their strategy is to present themselves as human beings, not as a big evil firm. Um, most firms don't do that very well. You know, the, the the big change that's happening is it used to be that a company spoke with only one or two voices from only one or two places, and now all the employees of the company, to some extent, represent the company. 
people on the website, people who tweet for the company, they also represent the company. And I think five or six years ago, Bill Gates, he was right about search, but I think he was wrong. He said, he talked about the digital nervous system, and the, which is basically the notion that a company is run by the head, and then all these nerves are everywhere, and they go to the head to get the directions from the brain. Uh, when I think actually a, a better model is the digital immune system, where every piece of the company has its own identity and, and its own behavior that's, and its own reaction to foreign inputs. Uh, so a, a company now needs to, <coughs> it needs to understand that its people are representations of itself, not simply things doing the bidding of the brain. It's, it's hard for many companies to do that, and that's what I meant when I talked earlier about you know, these old corporate structures that don't really understand how to, how to use their employees as representatives for the slave. I'm not sure that's answering your question. Uh, do, do you have any examples of like, people or companies that build their business strategy on basically of like the being in Using the users' content? Yeah. 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 Uh, AOL has been trying to do that. Um, every company that has, yeah, Facebook is doing that. And very effectively. <coughs> I mean, what creates the value of Facebook? It's, or if contacted, it's all the users. And, you know, again, uh, most people know that Facebook is a profitable company or a for profit company, and they don't want it. Uh, they don't think it's evil to make a profit. They think, am I getting value from Facebook? Am I able to reach my friends? Am I able to get, you know, today I went on to Facebook and I saw some of my sister's comments. And you know, I, I value that. I don't mind if Facebook makes money. My sister is there. And, then, you know, Facebook is, is a wonderful example of how to do that effect. I mean, for all their problems, and they have them and they make mistakes, they're a great example of that model. The second question is more, more generally. You mentioned that was one of the big problems in Russia is lack of trust. And, uh, and there, even in other countries, there are a lot of talks about how people have to build trust among people if they don't speak personally to each other. It becomes very anonymous. So, what is your point of view on how the internet affects this trust? Yeah. Um, I, I, the internet, you know, sometimes people say the internet makes. You, you said it, you know, I have to watch TV, I have to do all this Twitter. Who's forcing you? You, you choose to do that. And so the internet doesn't force people to do this, it allows them. So long ago I said, the internet is like when you first go to university and you discover, I don't know, these days you probably do this in high school, but you discover beer, alcohol. And you know, it's amazing stuff. You can use it to, you can get lost. You can go drinking every night and forget to do your studies. You can go to beer parties on Friday and you can sell life insurance. Or maybe, I don't know, you can sell drugs to your friends to pay your way through college. Or you can go to these parties and you can meet girls. Uh, you can use it well and to make your life richer, or you can use it to completely get lost and addicted. And the, the internet's the same. Uh, but on, on the thing, it does it improve relations between people. So my, my stepmother came from Germany in 1959 or something. I'm quite old. And when she left Germany, she was our own pair girl, and that's how she met my father and married my father. She pretty much left her family behind. It was a very expensive telephone call, or an even more expensive, uncomfortable... Well, originally it was a boat ride back in the 50s, and then later it was a flight. But now she's online with her sister. She's emailing. Uh, my sister's on Facebook. Uh, it actually keeps my family much closer together than before. And we don't want to be anonymous. We want to be recognized. And, yeah, the people who want to be anonymous, the people who want to go online and say mean things about other people, uh, and the people who want to be dissidents in China. The internet is very valuable and it allows anonymity. Uh, it also allows bad behavior. And so it's, it's essentially a very powerful tool. 
that can be used for good things and for bad things. And if you think human beings are fundamentally bad, then the internet's really dangerous because it lets more people do more bad things. If you think people are fundamentally good, then you think the internet's great because it lets more people do fundamentally good things, even though there's a trade-off of some bad things. And I believe people are fundamentally good, and that if you don't destroy them, they'll actually be better. So, that's my answer. So that's, that's why I don't just simply take everything and do it also in Russia. Um, but I guess my website isn't a very good website, to be honest. I, you're better off following me on Twitter. So what I'm really spending most of my time on right now is investments oriented towards health. And those, again, are mostly funded by other people with a little bit of money for me, and then I get involved. Uh, in Russia, I'm on the board of Yandex, I'm on the advisory boards of LiveJournal and IBS Group. So I am active here. I'm also an investor in a few other companies. Um, so I'm trying to answer your question, but also explain a little more of the context. Aviation and space is one part of what I do. I haven't given up on the internet part. I just haven't really done anything with my website. And so it, it probably doesn't send exactly 
an accurate explanation of what it is that I do. But I, I hope that sort of answers. And so just for why I'm doing all these different things. Uh, how many of you studied mathematics as well as economics? Okay, so I'm sure at some point you had a proof. And there's a professor, and he always he talks about a proof. And he gets to some point, you know, X, Y, Z. And then he says, the remainder of the proof is left as an exercise for the reader. <laughs> and I really enjoy that first part that's difficult, new, hard to understand, and has never been done before. And so for me, to be honest, a lot of what's happening on the internet now is left as an exercise for the reader. In space travel, I think we're still before that magic point that has been proved. And in many cases also in what I call user-generated health. That's not health care, that's not hospitals and clinics and drugs. It's how to get people to change their behavior to be healthy. Uh, how many of you eat bad food? Yeah, okay. Drink too much alcohol. Don't sleep enough. Uh, right, okay. And just telling you that that's wrong isn't going to change your behavior. But you, you've all heard of Farmville, the, the game on Zynga, I assume. Now imagine Bodyville. It's a game about your body. You get points for walking. You get more points for eating right. You get points for sleeping. You compete with your friends. And maybe that will motivate some proportion of people to be healthier. And maybe that will change the market and more companies will offer good food. And people in movies will, you know, they'll always do bad things and smoke cigarettes. But still, role models for people will be healthier. And both in Russia and in the U.S., a huge amount of bad health is not caused by diseases or germs. It's caused by people's own bad behavior. And how to change that has not yet been proved. And that's what I'm trying to do. So, uh, okay, uh, one, one hello? more. Yes. Uh, okay, this will be the last question. Okay, two, 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 two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this will be the Yes. And, and well, question, but... Go ahead. Uh, uh, I have two questions. First of all, what do you think about the current valuation of uh, internet companies such mm -hmm. as Facebook, Twitter, and so on? Yeah. Because according to share post uh, basically mm -hmm. uh, days ago, uh, Facebook uh, was valued, uh, let's say, yes, 17, so, 17, 17, 79 billion. So yeah. And uh, second question is uh, uh, where new Facebook come, comes from? Where what? Is where new Facebook? What what idea? Oh. Uh, What's what next? Promising now. What would be next? Yeah. Okay. Facebook or Twitter. Or something. So the very short answer is I think the valuations are crazy, and if I had to buy or sell, I'd be selling. Uh, that doesn't mean they won't go up, but they're they're kind of crazy. Um, if you're interested, go to Yandex.com and type in Groupon Dyson or go to ProjectSyndicate.org and you'll find something I just wrote about Groupon. I think Groupon in particular is pretty unsustainable. Uh, they create too many discounts. It's, you can just read it. That's a specific problem with Groupon as opposed to with its valuation. On the second question, what's next? Well, you, you sort of heard me. What's next is not a better Facebook, and it's certainly not a better Google. It's probably, the next big exciting things, I think, probably have to do with big data and with data structures, going back to the, the Google question about search and curation. Uh, things that can derive the structure of what looks like a complicated mess that can make sense and structure and context out of the real world, that's going to be one big thing. And I, I do think health and healthy behavior and motivation 
as opposed to information, is another huge one. And then the third is simply just the instrumentation of everything. So that, you know, this chair will have a specific identity. You'll be able to know which room it's in. Uh, every bus will have a little tag on it so you know when the buses are coming. I will no longer lose my cell phone because it will inform me where it is. And the world will become incredibly efficient. And human beings will remain inefficient, motivated by everything from greed to love to desire for attention. And human nature won't change. But our ability to do things, good or bad, will increase. And thank you all very much. I hope it was interesting. My email address is edison, E-D-Y-S-O-N, at ed, my initials, adventure.com, if you want to follow up. And they were great questions. Thanks for some of the, uh, thanks for what you taught me. Oh, thank you. Thank you.